Mr. Aldridge, you can come on back now. The pediatrician's assistant gave me a sympathetic smile before stepping aside to the open doorway, allowing entry while I carried the infant seat to the doctor's room. There have been far too many of these, too many waiting rooms, doctor's appointments, special treatments. When my girlfriend Marla first got pregnant, I knew my life would change, but, but this was devastating. We had met a little later in life. I had just turned 31, and Marla was halfway through her 32nd year. She was emotionally reeling from a vicious divorce, and I was, I was sifting through the sinew and mar of my own broken heart. I informed my college sweetheart that I wanted to marry her, and... Well, she informed me that she had been slowly moving her things out of our apartment to a new place. It wasn't pretty, but I can't help thinking I'd be better than where I find myself currently. Now that sounds awful. Marla and I became sin eaters for each other, truth tellers, if you will. If we told each other the brutal things our blinded hearts had overlooked in order to move on, with all the tension, deep talks, and shoulder crying, of course, it was only a matter of time before we mistook need and codependency for love. Things weren't bad, but I think... Somewhere in our heart of hearts, we both knew we'd settled. Even so, pregnancy was welcomed. We both yearned for a deeper purpose. One of the issues with Marla's divorce was that she hadn't been able to give him children. She was convinced that the reason she didn't conceive was because he wasn't the right man. As tough and guarded as I try to be, I won't deny that the idea of unconditional love wasn't bewitchingly enticing. The child would love me, and I love them, no matter what, forever. When our daughter Haley was born, our hearts exploded with love, pride, and beauty. I didn't care if Marla wasn't my first choice or how empty our bed seemed while we were both in it. Haley would have a father, and that's all that mattered. She had bright, beautiful blue eyes and a strawberry birthmark on her little left shoulder that looked like an angel's kiss. Marla was concerned about it at first, but I wasn't worried. See, I thought, I thought it was the sweetest thing I'd ever seen. Haley's APGAR score was exceptional, and we were allowed to leave the hospital a mere 40 hours later. Marla delivered wonderfully. There wasn't a tear or rip in the entire process. Graphic, I know, but like I said earlier, I was excited to have a baby. <laughs> I researched everything that I could, and this information was pertinent to Marla's aftercare. We put her in her car seat with a tie-dye cover, not just pinks or blues for our little girl. Our little miss deserved all the colors of the rainbow. The first ten days of parenthood seemed almost perfect. And then... Then it all changed. Healy began rejecting Marla's breast milk. The baby that slept through the night the week before was now up every hour with inconsolable anguish. We tried everything. Feeding her regular formula, soy formula. We drove her in the car, burped her, changed her, ignored her to cry it out. Sleeping in shifts wasn't possible with such a small apartment, which is how I figured out driving her in the car was useless. I was giving her a bath one morning, and I noticed something strange. Marla, come look at this, I called out. She came to me breathless, fearing that I'd dropped our daughter, and after feigning shock and offense, I pointed out the issue. Her birthmark's gone. She reached her hand out to touch Haley's shoulder, confirming my suspicion. The doctor did say it would be only temporary, she said dismissively, waving the worry away with a flick of her wrist. The next couple of weeks would show that I was right to worry. Haley continued to reject the majority of her food, and when she wasn't crying inconsolably, we'd catch her staring into space. She wouldn't move. She wouldn't blink. It was eerie. By the time her next doctor appointment came, Marla and I had an entire list of concerns for the doctor. Our precious baby girl was labeled as failure to thrive at her first month checkup. Soon after, her skin broke out in mottled blotches. To top that all off, I was beginning to suspect... No. 
You know, I knew that we had a rat problem in the apartment. All sorts of sound would come from inside the walls. If I didn't know any better, I'd say that something large was in there. Maybe a squirrel, even a cat. There was skittering, pounding, even yowling at points. The majority of the activity was at night. We may not even have noticed it if we weren't up every hour with the baby. Marla got a promotion at work that brought our family a lot more money, but it also brought her a lot more responsibility. The pay increase allowed me to be home full-time with Haley. I was able to take her to all the doctor's appointments and travel to see specialists. Not that any of it helped. The only even remotely close diagnosis for a baby with this condition was drug withdrawal. And Marla had been drug tested throughout her pregnancy, birth, and for her new job. She'd passed all with flying colors. Marla didn't even take so much as Tylenol. The emotional... The emotional pain, worry, and stress weighed heavily on both of us. Instantaneous, unprepared care and problems thrust upon two lost souls takes its toll. I still love her, and she's worth it. When she looks at me with those brown doe eyes, I fall in love every time. But I'm not going to give you sunshine and rainbows. And my life is full of crying tests, baby puke, and sickening smells of disinfectant. And that's another thing. Haley's eyes changed into a dark golden brown. Now, I wasn't an expert on genetics, but Marla and I both have blue eyes. If we lived a normal life with a healthy child, maybe my mind would have made that an issue. But fortunately for us, we didn't have the luxury of time to make assumptions. But don't think there weren't times where I didn't peck at my mind like a vulture on a carcass. Each intrusive thought rotted my soul little bits at a time. Which brings us to the beginning. Me sitting here in the doctor's office with Haley staring at alphabet choo-choo train papered walls. Marla had an early shift this morning and hopefully will be waiting for us by the time we get home. The doorknob squeaks in protest as the doctor enters the room. By this point, I have Haley down to just a clean diaper and ready to get it over with. Well, she begins. Diagnostically, I can't find anything wrong with this little lady. She's still in an alarmingly low percentile for her age and length. But we'll get there. Her face grows stern. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to send someone for a home visit. Whoa, I started. She holds her hand up defensively. I know what you're thinking. They won't be there to judge or in any official capacity. I just want to see if Haley's health issues are biological or environmental. We had one patient last year that was 13 months old. She broke out in hives and breathing troubles every time her mother took her outside. After a home visit, we were able to determine that she was allergic to the jasmine bushes throughout their yard. Anything to help her, I said. I relented. They came to the house a few days later, and luckily, nothing major was found. The only thing they did find was a minute amount of mold in the lower corner of her nursery, along with the molding of the wall. It was definitely a health hazard, but still didn't explain her digestive and skin issues. Her respiration and breathing were fine. Those were one of the few areas where Haley excelled health-wise, in fact. After they left, I decided to inspect the area. It seemed like an easy enough fix, just remove the molding, scrub it with bleach, let it dry. I pulled off the molding, which wasn't even attached properly, revealing that the wall behind it had been knocked loose. The state of the wall was so bad that two of my fingers slipped right through the drywall. The gypsum crumbling like mud in my hands. The earth and toxic smell made my stomach retch and my head spin. As I removed my hand, I saw the partial part of a foot peeking out from inside the walls. The police arrived almost immediately. I met them outside, holding my daughter to my chest tightly. Marla pulled into the driveway, stunned to see two cop cars with sirens blaring parked on the curb by the mailbox. I grabbed her with my free arm as she tried to run into the house. 
After she saw the baby was safe in my arms, she relaxed enough for me to tell her what was going on. Three of the four police officers on scene emerged from our once safe and quiet home. We were utterly stunned at what they found. A man and a woman, so filthy it was almost impossible to tell their age or distinctive features. Whatever teeth they had in their better years had been smoked away long ago. The man's face had been covered with scabs. Some healed, some kept open by years of habit and miscare. His companion didn't fare much better. Their eyes were jet black orbs. They twitched and spasmed with jitters of addiction as police led them through our yard. The fourth officer stepped slowly through the doorway. He was struggling to blanket an infant child. I pulled Haley away from my chest to look at her. Almost not able to believe what I was seeing. The officer had bundled the baby by now. She looked at me. She was... She was a gorgeous baby. The one with blue eyes. And strawberry birthmark on her little left shoulder. I'm terrified and I have no idea what to do. I don't know when the switch took place and I have no idea what to do next. The police took the baby, our baby, with them to get her checked out by a medical team. We're doing all that we can to get her back to our care. But until then, the child we do have is a... is a mystery to me. Marla's detached from both of us completely. Haley's health seems to be getting better, but her eyes are getting darker. Every day, they're coffee bean brown now, almost black. There's definitely something wrong with this baby. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I also want to tell you guys, if you look in the description, there's a lot of really cool things that you can always see down there, including uh, links over to two Creepypasta books that I curated that are available now on Amazon. Check those out. The Creepypasta Collection Volume 1 and Volume 2. They're great for people that like horror or creepypastas or people who listen to this podcast. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakin, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chambinski, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Rihanna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>